Please, all of it, take it, share it. Everything I'm showing today is fair game. Okay. Welcome to the Magic of the Gathering panel. Welcome. So I'm your host, Mark Rosewater, Magic the Gathering head designer. So, so far, I think I've uh, led 34 release sets, six more that haven't been released yet. Um, I have a weekly column, I have a weekly blog, a good comment. I also do a blog where every day you can ask me questions. And today is Blog and Talk Live, where you guys get to ask me questions live. With no safety net, I have to do live for it. On my blog, I can take what I answer. So here, I'll answer what's after me. Okay, but before, I, before we do that, before we do question and answer, I always do a presentation, and I always sort of talk about something. So normally how this works behind the scenes is, I go to our marketing people, and I say, well, what do you want, what do you want me to talk about this year? And normally they, oh, talk about this, talk about that. And they go, oh, I don't know. We were planning on Thursday to announce Dominaria United, so I don't, you don't really need to talk about Dominaria United. What would you like to talk about? And I'm like, what would I like to talk about? They're yeah. No, no, no. So what, what would I, so I can talk about what I want to talk about? And they go, sure. So let's talk on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so uh, our story starts back in 2017 when Unstable came out. So there was a 14 year gap between Unhinged, which was the second onset, and Unstable, which was the third onset. Um, there was a lot of doubt in the building. It was an uphill climb to get Unstable made. But Unstable came out and did really well. It got reprinted four times, which is very good for magic. You know, it's really good to get reprinted four times. So, um, one of the things that we did with Unstable, oh, and because it did so well, somebody that wasn't me said, would you like to make another unset? To which you always answer, yes, of course. Um, so what we had done with Unstable was, I took a cool concept of magic, something that we like to do in normal magic, faction sets, and I said, let's apply that to the unsets. Let's, so Unstable had five different factions that were allied colored, and each faction had a theme and a flavor, and you know, we had creative mechanics all tied up. And it was very successful. So I said, okay, that, that worked well. Let's try something else. Let's try something new. So what I said is, I wanted to do a top-down set. So Ravnica, no, Ravnica, Innistrad, um, Amoncats, Thorndell Brain, you know, sets in which we took some concept and then we built from it. That the audience knows what it is, and we can build things top down from it. So what I did is I went to Don Mirren. Don was the art director that I worked with for Unstable. Don's awesome. Um, she's the only person, by the way, to ever swear on my podcast. We had to leave it up. But um, anyway, so I said to Don, I want to do a top down thing, but I don't want to step on the toes of like normal magic. I mean, we're an unset. We shouldn't be doing what a normal set would do. Let's do something different. So Don went away and said, okay, we'll come back in a week and we'll share with each other our idea. So we came back a week later and Don goes, okay, I got it. Retro science fiction. So not just science fiction, but science fiction as viewed from like the 1950s, right? Sort of uh, this sort of what we thought the future would be like. It's a very stylistic thing. Dawn is an art, art you know, she's an art director, she loves stylistic. She said, that would be really cool. I said, well, here's what I was thinking. How about a circus? <laughs> um, I, I always have wanted to do this. In fact, if you ever watch the second great designer search, in it, one of the challenges was designing cars for a circus, because I honestly thought we'd never make it. Um, but I realized in a circus, there wasn't quite enough there. So I said, well, not just a circus. We can have a music park, we can have a carnival. You know, we can do the whole thing, right? That, that all, it's all interconnected. So Dawn looked at my idea, I looked at her idea, and we decided to do both. <laughs> so I want to introduce, oops, sorry, um, Myra the Magnificence, Intergalactic Astratorium of Fun. <laughs> so I do want to point out that most of the art you're going to see in this presentation are from the set. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but you guys can piece some of that together. Um, so the idea is that this is a space carnival that, that, that is made of a spaceship and they travel from planet to planet with this wonderful, exciting uh, carnival slash new bar slash 
Okay, so that last November, I, uh, we do what we call a, a pre-beat. In order for uh, the people who buy the product, the stores and stuff, and the distributors, we have to tell them about three months ahead of time um, what the set's going to be so they can order it in time. And so we, we do that, what's called the pre-beat. Um, originally, this was supposed to come out April 1st. And because of the holidays, we did it before the holidays. So it was a little bit earlier than normal, but in November, I wrote an article. I just want to recap real quickly, since not everybody here might be up to date. A quick recap of what we've already said is going to be in the set. Okay, here's the recap. First, the unset introduced basic, full out basic land. That was the very first one ever was on Lynn, the second ever was on him. Eventually, the magic figured out the awesome and started putting them in lots of sets. But, um, of course, we have to have full out basic lands. But since we are a sci-fi set, set in space, they're not basic lands. They are spacing lands. <laughs> um, so we're going to do two different cycles of them. The first one we're calling planetary. That means they're alien planets from the ground. And the second cycle we're calling orbital. Those are from space. So the planetary ones are slightly more common than the orbital ones, but they both show up in decent frequency, so you will get your hands on both. Also, I'm not sure how I convinced them to do this, but I convinced them to put the shock lands in the And uh, we're going to have all ten space shock lands. By the way, I'm still just recapping what you already know, but you're very excited, so okay. <laughs> Wait till I get the new stuff. Okay, um, also in the set, we said there's going to be 30 legendary creatures. Um, you guys might not have heard of this. There's a format called Commander that's gotten a little bit um, So we wanted to do a lot of legendary creatures, and um, we thought it might be fun to do a booster fun version. So our booster fun version, all the legends have one. We're calling it the Showcase Cards of Tomorrow. And what we did is, um, inspired by the retro sort of vibe, um, we did pictures. Of, we, we, we had the artists do the normal pictures, and then sent the completed art to a new artist to do a retro pop style. So today, whenever I show you a legendary card, I will also show you the retro pop version. They're very cute. <laughs> okay, also, for the first time in an onset, cards will be playable in eternal formats. <laughs> over half the cards in the whole set, and over a fourth of the rares and mythic rares, are playable in eternal formats. AKA Commander Vintage Legacy. Um, we refer to these as a term. Uh, they have an oval security stamp right there. Um, this is like a normal stamp that you have a normal card. The commons and uncommons don't have a stamp. If you see no stamp, that means they're normal eternal cards. Uh, and we'll get to the acorn in a second. But if you see no stamp on a common or uncommon, it's eternal legal. If, if it's rare, mythic rare, it'll have the normal oval stamp on it. Okay. This means Silver Border is gone. There's no Silver Border in the set. So instead of Silver Border, uh, we have what's called an Acorn Security Stamp. Um, looks like that. Uh, it is, it's down there. Um, and so that is what Silver Border used to be, meaning if you see an Acorn, it's not playable in tournaments and stuff. Um, in casual play, you're supposed to ask your friends, but hopefully your friends will let you play some of these because they're really fun. Okay. We refer to these as Acorn, by the way. So there's Eternal and Acorn. <laughs> so when we announced the set, we said there were 244 cards. We later realized that we didn't count the shot lands. So if you count the shot lands, there's 254 cards. <laughs> also, there's something in the set that's not technically a card. If you, if you notice when we sent out to the retailer, it said 14 cards plus one playable game object. If you count the playable game objects, there's 302 cards. Uh, we, will, we will get to the playable game now. Okay, that is the recap. Okay, so let's get now to the making of the set. So there were four things we were trying to do in making the set. First, make fun cards, right? This is, this is an unset. Uh, the whole so There's a spectrum of magic from very, very competitive to very, very fun. We are on the, the as far as we can go on this side of the spectrum, this, this set, unset, has always been about having fun with your friends, and every choice we make maximizes having fun and doesn't worry quite as much about will cause problems in tournaments or whatever, you know. But as we get to the eternal acorn things, you'll see some of them will be acorn, some will be eternal. We, we, the eternal cards have to care about the tournaments, so we do. Okay, number two, we have to ensure that science fiction feels like magic. We're doing something, I mean, 
One can argue a few other sets of done science fiction, but we're, we're pushing the boundary even more than normal, and we want to make sure this still feels like magic. We want it to, this is still supposed to be a magic set, so we want it to feel like that. Uh, we want to capture the top-down tropes. So, you know, if we're going to do a top-down set, well, let's deliver on the top-down set. Uh, and we'll be talking about that. And finally, we have to understand this acorn eternal divide. What does it mean? What does it mean that half the set is playable in tournaments and half the set is? Like, what does that mean? We have to figure that out. Okay, so we're going to start with making fun cards. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put an image up, and I'm not going to talk for 30 seconds to let you absorb it, and then I will talk about it. But I need to give you 30 seconds to absorb the image. Traditional sense. 
Okay, how do they work? Let's talk about it. Okay, so some cards, like Carnival Carnivore here, let you sticker a permanent. Um, you can only sticker cards you own. Even, even though the shouldn't harm your cards, we don't want you to mess with your own cards, so you can only sticker your own cards. And you can only sticker non-land permanents. So they can go on any creature, any artifact, any champion, any planeswalker, um, not land because it costs game problems, so you can't run on lands. You don't really, you know, you can't run on lands. Um, they used to do it when you broke it, so you can't run on lands. <laughs> um, most cards that let you sticker also give you some number of tickets. So for example, card for Powerboard, uh, not only did he get, first he gives you a ticket, and then he lets you sticker on that permanent. Now, if this was the first one you played, only six mana, so hopefully not. Um, <laughs> the cheapest sticker cost is two, so one sticker, one ticket's not enough to do. You need two tickets to, to use any ability or card um, But tickets are like energy. Uh, they're a counter that you, the player, get. You can save up tickets to use whenever you want, and you're not forced to spend them. So, Whenever you're a sticker, we'll first, often we give you tickets, not always, but often we give you tickets, and then when it's time to sticker, you can sticker what you want to sticker, but um, you need to spend the tickets in order to sticker the ability to help on this. Okay, so you, you, you can't sticker the ability to help sticker both. Okay, some cards will only let you sticker a particular sticker. So, for example, Angelic Herald only lets you use a name sticker. But, if it doesn't say, you can sticker anything. So if it just says sticker, sticker, you can put a name, an art sticker, a note sticker, or a PT to pay for it. Um, but if it doesn't say, you can do anything, but it, some of them tell you. For example, Angelic Herald tells you. Um, and once again, you, you can only sticker on non-land permits you own. Um, and you have to pay the ticket cost for the ability of PT stickers. If you don't have the cost, you can't do that. Um, the set is full of cards that care about names and art. So, Putting on stickers, for example, hats matter in the set. So putting a hat on a creature now makes a creature have a hat. <laughs> Some creatures naturally in the art have hats. So those don't really have a hat. Um, but putting a sticker on them will help, for example. Um, so adding a name or art sticker can mechanically matter, especially in this set. Um, adding an ability or changing your power toughness, well, that already matters. I mean, you don't have to do anything. Adding abilities or, or changing power toughness will make the card better. Um, there are also cards that care about whether or not a card is stickered. So the mere act of stickering something sometimes will, will either make that card better or maybe make another card better, but there are cards that care about things being stickered. Uh, as a young hero is a legendary creature, we have a showcase card tomorrow about our top version, which is very cute. But by the way, I'm very proud of his name. We, we, uh, uh, the, you'll notice there's a lot of puns in the set. Okay, so we've gotten pretty creative with how you can use stickers. This, by the way, I think is the card that got made the earliest in the set that lasted all the way through the set. This was an exploratory, I and mean, then we changed it a bunch. But. And um, I've attacked with tape dispensers, I've attacked with uh, remote controls, I've attacked with my shoe ones, so you can do fun stuff. Um, okay, so a card can only have one PC sticker at a time. Um, so you can't have multiple PC stickers at once. You can sticker over them. So let's say I have a 1-1 one, one, and I put a 2-2 two, two on it. I can maybe put a 3-3 three, three on it. But I can only ever have one, like the card can only ever have one PT. So it, it can't have multiple powers and toughnesses. Um, but name on the other stickers you get as many as you want. Those aren't restricted. So you can have lots of art, lots of needs, lots of abilities. Those, um, those are additives. Meaning they, they don't remove things from the card. So if you add them, even if they cover things up, they, they don't actually move from the card, they still have to stay. Okay, so it just, you have to do your best to fit them on the card. They're, if they stick off a little bit, it's okay. And that only happens when you put a lot of them on, but that happens. Okay, so the stickers stay on in any public zone. That's the battlefield, the graveyard, and exile. So if I um, put a creature into the battlefield, like, sorry, into the graveyard, it dies or something, the sticker stays on it. If I flicker it and it goes to exile or comes back, the sticker stays on it. So any public zone, the sticker stays. Um, and then, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. They, they, I think I skipped it. 
If they go to a uh, non-public zone, which is your hand or the library, then um, they return the sticker card if they go to a hidden zone. Oh, that's right. They return the sticker card if they go to a hidden zone. That's your hand or your library. Sorry. I confused myself. Um, so basically, if it goes to a, a non-public non zone, the sticker goes away, goes off the card, it goes back up to the sticker sheet. But cards go back to your sticker sheet can be used again. So for example, you strategically might want to bounce your own creature so that you then can put the sticker on a different card. So there's strategic reasons why the sticker coming off might be of use to you, because you then can reuse it. So the majority of sticker cards are eternal. This is this wicker picker, who, whose name never changed from his first creation. He has sticker picker, that's why he's sticker picker. <laughs> Um, anyway, the majority of sticker cards are eternal, meaning they can be used in any eternal format. Uh, in constructed, here, here's how it works. You choose 10 unique ones, so, and then you randomly pick three at the start of each game. So, um, what that means is you have some control, you pick what 10 to pick with, but in any one game, you don't know which three you're going to have. So, you, the whole point of it is sort of, we want some randomness built in. The intent here is not, I just have auras that I always know I can have. It's, I'm going to have some variety each time. We are all pla we're planning to do something uh, virtually that if you want to play casually and randomly pick three every time, we will give you a tool to help you do that online. So if you want to play for fun casually and go, I just want three random things every time, we will help you do that. Um, but in a, in a constructive play, you bring ten and randomly pick three. That's how you play. In limited, you get whatever stickers you open. Um, sticker sheets aren't drafted. We did try drafting them. It just proved to be a little bit too much. If you and your friends want to draft them, I'm not going to stop you, you can. But we're recommending not drafting them, just playing the stickers you open. And just so you understand, one of the things we try to do in unsets is have high variance. Um, high variance is a lot of fun. Competitive tournaments don't like high variance. Can do that. So the sticker sheets are super high variance because there's a lot going on. Um, and so, to be honest, it's more fun if you keep, like, it's more fun if you're playing different sticker sheets rather than always playing the same sticker sheet. So that's kind of what's built in that way. Right? Okay, let's move on to the next category. Um, ensure science fiction feels like magic. So the whole point of doing science fiction was to be able to tap into new creative elements. Like, we're going to do science fiction, let's do science fiction. So, for example, we wanted aliens. So these are the Blorbians. Um, there are a bunch of different aliens in the set, but these are the main aliens. So the Blorbians, so uh, the captain who drives the Astratorium is named Captain Rex Nebula. Uh, and he accidentally backed into the Blorbian planet and destroyed it. And so um, Myra gave them permanent, uh, so they, they now live on the, um, they, they live on the Astratorium. So the Blorbians, and the Blorbians have gotten really good at all the games on the Astratorium. And so anyway, um, the Blorbians are very cute. There's a bunch of Blorbians in the set. Robots. Um, so all the clowns in the set are robots. And then there's also robots that aren't clowns that do a lot of functions. One of the things about uh, all robots have one main function, and they do that one function really well, but they have one function. This one's a mind, by the way. Um, and so there, there are a lot of fun robots. Robot tribal is a thing. Uh, you can draft it. Um, it's red, right? Um, so anyway, it is a thing you can do, and uh, robots robots are one of the tribal things, or the main tribal thing you can draft. We want a spaceship. Now the entire the entire tutorial itself is a spaceship, but we when I say spaceships, we just wanted a lot of the accoutrement that goes with science fiction. You'll see a lot of that stuff. Um, and we wanted technology, right? We wanted we, this is science fiction, right? So we really wanted you to see a lot of technology. But, how do we have technology, but still feel like a magic set? How do we do that? Um, so we thought long and hard about it, and we, we found a solution. So what we did is, we put all the tropes in the setting, so all the stuff I'm talking about that fits there in the setting, but we filled the park with magic creatures. So the idea is, the park has a lot of science fiction trappings to it, but you should recognize most of the creatures. I mean, there's some aliens and robots, but you should recognize most of the creatures. So for example, um, Meet Tross, uh, she's the chief engineer. She's a legendary creature. Um, and she's a Vidalkin, for example. So there's a bunch of Vidalkin that work on the thing. Um, you will see zombies. Uh, this is uh, a long time stand in the park. Um, Starting when he was living, but dying shouldn't really keep you from having fun. Um, 
We have goblins. What? So this is one of the goblins that works for the park. So he sells Devil K. Neville. So Devil K. Neville is a legendary creature of the set. Um, he's a daredevil, but literally a devil. Um, but anyway, uh, he's a his character. You guys, I mean, one of the set comes out in weeks. Uh, we'll have demons, because why not? Um, this, this demon uh, has its own game that we can play. You get three tries for a soul, so. Uh, Merfolk. Uh, so this Merfolk is kind of like the lion that sticks its head in the lion's head. That's a giant sea beast, and she's swimming inside the sea beast's head. So. We have vampires. So um, vampires work, uh, all the stores are run by vampires. And uh, so, by the way, there's, I only showed you some of the art, but there's elves. And there's all the, a lot of things you would expect to see, a lot of magic stable creatures are there. Okay, so talk about capturing the top down tropes. So we want carnivals, we want amusement parks, we want circus. So what we did is, we wrote down a giant list of everything you would expect to see that would be in any of those things. And we cross indexed it with some of the things that were blocking categories, we made a giant list. We might not have got everything, but we got like 95%. So we did a lot of stuff. So uh, I got permission to show you a bunch of art. So I'm just going to show you some of the some of the tropes we captured. Uh, so we'll start with carnivals. Well, you, you have to have a prize wall. Um, and one of the things you'll notice when you look at the prize wall is there's a lot. So the park has a magic theme. The IP of the park is magic. So there's infinite magic jokes hidden in this. Um, and so. Uh, if you look at the objects, some of these objects are old method objects. There, there's a plushy for Johnny there. Um, but anyway, it, I'm going to try to let you look at the art, but we have more chance to look at the art, that there's a lot of hidden stuff in it, so there's a lot. The artist did a really, really good job of just filling it with lots of fun stuff, so the art has infinite jokes in it. Also, you've got a face painting, but it has a magic IP, so, you know, what kid doesn't want to be a person? <laughs> uh, we have to have a caricaturist, and our character, his name is Doodle, he's our caricaturist. So, um, ro robots fill a lot of functions in the park, for example, doing caricatures. And you gotta have a pie eating contest. <laughs> so, this is our pie eating card. Um, it's not fair, I think some people are a little better pie eating than others. Uh, amusement park. Well, we have to have a, a boardwalk, and we have to have exciting things to do. And like I said, there's infinite magic shows about this thing. Um, like there's a car over there, and there's a lot of um, We want to have lions and people working working things. And, you know, there's, there's a lot, and there's more Borbians. The Borbians are in the center. And there's a wild, if you look back, there's a wild ride behind them. Oh, one of the themes of the park, by the way, is Milo believes that you want to be you want to be exciting. So the rides are really, really exciting. Safe is not nearly as important to her as exciting. So they're super exciting. Eh, safety is like lower down the road. But they're like crazy, crazy rides. They're very exciting. Gotta have parades. That's Grand Marshal Macy is her name. Um, and she leads the parades and there's a lot of robots in the parade. And of course you gotta have pins. So every pin here, by the way, is a reference of a different card. You can see the mind robot, for example, in the bottom. That's the mind robot. But all these, all these. So there's a lot of jokes and there's a lot of self-referential things if you like to do it on set. So there's a lot of referring to other cards. So as you start seeing the set, there's a lot of fun things built up on the part. So in a circus, we need performers. Uh, here's an example of a loxodon performer. Like I said, there's a lot of magic performers. Um, and so you, you have people doing high, high work, people spinning plates. Uh, contortionists <laughs> and people shooting themselves out of cannons. This is a robot, of course. A, a non-shooting cannon. Okay, but um, as we did the top down design, we realized there was something we really wanted to capture. Um, rise, games, stands, that there, there's a core element that shows up at, at a carnival, what you might call attractions. So this is our second mechanic. Now, I wanted to show you, I wanted to completely explain what attractions were, but they're like, you can't tell them everything, you have to 
say something for the actual preview. So here's the deal I struck with, with my bosses. I can't show you the text, but they're gonna let me show you the frame. So other than the name, I have to cover all the text. But the frames are awesome, so I'm gonna show you the frames. So like I said, uh, we wanted to have rides and games and stands. So I, I can't explain how this works just yet, but hopefully the frames will give you some clue that they're not normal cards. <laughs> Uh, and they, uh, I covered up the text, but there, there's some see-through that you can't see because I covered up the text. But, but anyway, this is uh, attraction. So the two main mechanics in the set are stickers and attractions. Um, there also will be die rolling, outside assistance, and a lot of the, the normal stuff you would see. Um, like I said before, um, hats matter as a theme, robots are a theme, um, that there are a lot of names matter stuff going on in the set. So there's, all, you know, there's names matter, art matters, all the sticker stuff. Uh, we'll care about it. Okay, so finally, understand the eight horn turn of the vibe. So I did an in my article that I, I explained this, I said that we, what we did is we wrote down all the things like, what, is it, what do you need to be to be an eight horn? What makes you an eight horn? So the idea in this set is that we would like the default is your an eternal card, but if there's a reason to make you an eternal, we'll make you. But hey, if we can let people play with it. Back when we made Unstable, not Stable, when we made Unglued, um, non turn and legal, like it was, there was type 1 and type 2, which were now called standard and vintage. And not turn it was supposed to be everything else. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, it was supposed to be everything else. So originally when we made Unglued, the, the majority of formats used them. But over the time, it, it ended up being, well, tournaments were everything. So formats didn't use non-tournament cards. Um, so what we were trying to do in, an, um, in Infinity is there's a lot of cards, like, there's no reason not to let you play with them. There's cards in the stable that we can let you play. Like, the rules to let you play with them. It was just weird that because they were in the set that you couldn't play with some of the set, we didn't let you play with any of the set. And so that's a philosophy here. So here's, we made a list of six things that get you into our acorn stats. Number one is you don't work in the rules. And what that means is, in order to work in the rules, you have to work in every corner case. There are a lot of rules that you guys understand. Well, last Strike is a good example. Everybody understands Last Strike. It's not confusing. It's not that humans can't play it. It's the rules can't handle it because there's this weird corner case problem with it. Um, but we, we want you guys to be able to play those cards because they're fun cards. So, but if you don't work in the rules for structure for tournaments, okay, you have to work eight and they don't work in the rules. Next is, they reference something normal Magic can. There's a rule in Magic that says, uh, in a normal tournament play, any card that shares an English name with another card has to be identical. So anything that would be different between cards, um, a watermark, an expansion symbol, an artist, you, we, we can't reference any of that. None of that is mechanical. Once again, it's not that you guys can't understand it. It's not that the players can't play it. It's just a rule that tournaments need to have. But, if we do that, that means it has to be an eight card. Third, uh, inter interaction with outsiders. Uh, we do a lot with the outside assistants where you ask people. And, and we, we did a lot of fun making new kinds of outside assistants where you're asking different things. They're not just simple questions anymore. You're doing a lot of cool things with the outside people. But we don't want like just cheating concerns. Like in a tournament, there's concerns. So if you're involving other people, that has to be eight um, Physical dexterity. There's a lot of fun cards that we can do. But we don't want that in tournaments. Okay, so if we're making you do things, and there's some really fun physical cards to set, um, you know, so that's how we get If it reference something external to the game, what time of day is it, whatever. Like, there's a lot of fun things that there's weird variances that you can care about, but okay, we can't do that in tournament, so that's there. And finally, it just doesn't feel right. Um, when the actual set comes out, there's a couple cards that were originally not acorn, and everybody already complained about them, and I made them acorn. Not because they couldn't be, but like it just felt wrong to everybody. I have no example today, but none of mine fit that category. But when the set comes out, there's, there's like one card specifically that the, like, everybody signed off on it, and then R&D as a whole said no, and we ended up doing it. Okay, so here's another card. Okay, so Far Out basically says, Whenever you're going to pick a mode, you can pick as many modes as you want. 
Okay, so far out does something we've tried many times to do normal magic. I've tried to make this card so many times in normal magic. Because um, it's fun to mess with cards, right? But the way the rules work, it just doesn't, it doesn't work in the rules. That there's some weird corner case problems that don't have, like, when I say corner case, I don't mean things that actually come up and play. I just mean the rules need things to be tight from a technical standpoint, and it, this just doesn't work. But that's why unsets exist. To let us make cool fun designs that fall through the cracks. Like, this is a very fun card. Players have been asking for this card forever. Let's just make the card. Let players have fun with the modes. It, it's, it's functional, people understand how to play with it, just the rules can't handle it, so why not have it? Uh, but these have to stay eight one. Okay, it's me, guy with the magic strings. So, uh, what this card does is it lets you turn instants and sorceries basically into three, three creatures that whenever they hit your opponent, their saboteur effect is what the instant and sorcery does. So, when I really was on made of the magic strings, I didn't think the rules could handle it. I actually thought that I was making something that had to be an uncard. Um, it's a really quirky, it's a really quirky card. Um, but it turned out with the right template, it was feasible. So why not let Eternal Format play with it? If it, it actually does work in the rules. So then, this is the core philosophy behind making what happens at Eternal Legal. Don't fence off uncards if they don't need to be fenced off. If the, if the game can handle it, okay, let, 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 let's handle it. And so, that is the general philosophy we've done. By the way, you'll notice that Maybar is a legendary creature. Uh, so we get a fun um, showcase card to tomorrow. And these are super cute. I have hopefully you get the chance of this. Okay, before we get to questions, uh, I picked up a whole bunch of really fun art, and there were a couple pieces that I couldn't fit anywhere else, so I have a few more pieces of art to show you. They're not going to say anything about the core. Nice. <laughs> Face puppy. So just a final last thing. So this comes out October 7th. Um, there's no pre-release for onsets, but there is a release day event, and there's a participation, participation promo card. Water gun balloon gauge uh, was in unhinged, and it was one of the few things we couldn't do because we've already done it. So we made a special one that uses an Astro Twine piece of art, and it's while supplies last, it's a participation promo. Uh, also, so this product's only sold in draft and collector boosters, there's no set boosters. Uh, and there's a foil shotgun box topper on both Box of the Draft and Box of the Collector Booster. Uh, normal foil. In Collector Boosters, there's another kind of foil called Galaxy Foil, which looks like space. And that's only in the Collector Booster. And then also, you can get, in the, in the side of the boosters, you can get um, Galaxy Foil um, shotgun and, and, and normal land in the Collector Boosters. Okay, now we get to the uh, So there is a um, microphone. So people can step up. That is time for questions. So by the way, I need to limit each person to one question so we can get through as many questions as possible. So go ahead. Hey Mark, uh, is Infinity going to be released on Arena? Um, Infinity is not going to be released on Arena, but there are some cards being released on Magic Online. So Magic Online is trying to do as much of the Eternal cards as they can. Um, not all of them I think are going to be on Magic Online, but Magic Online is trying to do as much of the online cards. So Arena's not doing it, Magic Online's going to do some of them, but none of the Acorn ones and only Eternal ones, but not, not necessarily all the Eternal ones. There's, there's a few of them, a few of them presented some digital issues, even though that they weren't the rules Okay, next. That's fine. But um, I've just played as this in the past, and I can't have five years, and so it no longer fits. I love the custom, and this one works, but today I'm Chandra, and I want to know the truth is this is Chandra's girlfriend. <laughs> 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 so we, we have 
canonically established that Chandra um, is an equal lover to all, all genders. Um, she, she, has, she has had boyfriends and girlfriends. So, um, she, um, what's the correct, pan, uh, pansexual? So, anyway, <laughs> Chandra loves who she loves. That where her heart takes her is who Chandra loves. Oh, I, um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, we made the, the basic lands. I don't know. From, I mean, Arena might make use of the basic lands. I know they're not doing the normal stuff, but maybe, I don't know the answer to that. But um, they okay. have access to all our art, so if they want to do something, they, they're able to do it. I mean, they, they have the right to do it, and maybe they will. I don't know. Please ask them to do it. <laughs> Hi. My question is about the main stickers and self-referential cards. The main, the main, name, the naming stickers. The name stickers, yes. Stickers. If you change the name of a card that self-references itself and its abilities, oh, yeah. how does that work for its abilities? Because it's no longer that named card. Right, I mean, okay, you're, I, I've not done all the FAQ work yet. Um, <laughs> I, oh, oh, by the way, so the way it's gonna work is just, um, Jeff Dunst is the rules manager, so he and I are going to do the document together. I'm answering all the unquestions. He's answering all the not unquestioned, the eternal cards. So technically, your answer is a Jeff's question or not. But um, I believe if you sticker a card and change its name, that card is not the name that's being referenced anymore. I believe that's how it's going to work. But Jeff is going to be answering that, so I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing what the answer is. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Uh, one thing I've always loved about Magic is how the cards are do a really good representation of how the flavor fits the mechanics. And so my question for you is, um, what's your favorite encapsulation of the mechanics and flavor translated to the card mechanics? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of like really good top-down... Like, one of the things I enjoyed a lot about Night, Night Day, for example, in um, Midnight Hunt was, I thought it was a much better representation of like, oh, this thing shifts and things care about whether it's this or that. Um, I don't just, I mean, there's a lot of really flavorful things. I don't know what's my favorite, like, of all your children. I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, that's a hard question. Um, I do like Night Day a lot. I do like, um, uh, attractions, I like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. But, by the way, real quickly, I can't tell you how they work, but I'm really, really proud of the attractions that we, they are all very much top-down design so that the drop tower feels like a drop tower, the concession stand feels like a concession stand. So um, we tried really, really hard in, in Infinity to do a lot of really flavorful top-down, and so I, I hope you guys get a chance to play with it. Like, we tried to one for one as much as we can, so like, it does feel like the thing it's supposed to be. Thank you. Uh, hello, I have a statement that leads into a question. Okay. <laughs> so for me, over the last couple of years, it feels like because we're only getting singular sets and singular planes, Mechanics feel like there's just not enough space to fully explore them. Like, I, I talked to a bunch of people who are like, I wish we would have gotten more of insert mechanic or something. Sure, sure. Uh, is this also a crunch that's being felt by design, by the design team? And as a follow up for that, has the design team considered maybe paring down the number of mechanics per set, say from five to four or three? Thank you. So, okay, so that's a very complex question. I'll do the best I can to answer. So, there's a larger tension that's going on. Um, magic used to be centered in standard. And so standard is a 60 card for all format. So if you want to make a mechanic work in standard, you needed like seven to nine cards. Like, like you could make it work with a much smaller amount of cards. The same size mechanic to work in a, in a 100 singleton format, you need six times the volume. And so one of the problems we've run into is that even if we had a block, even if we had three sets, that, that still wasn't enough. It's very hard when we do a new linear theme to sort of make it fit in something like Commander. So we've been doing a lot of things a little bit differently. Um, one of the big things we've been doing is, um, for example, in um, Dominaria, we did uh, Historic, which is what we call batching. Where he said, let's make a new mechanic, but instead of making brand new things that are brand new, we'll care about things that already exist.
so that, you know, his, like, you can make a historic commander deck right away because there's, a, there's all these years of artifacts and chant, maybe not a lot of sagas at the time, but there was a lot of things you could do. So we are doing more work to try to do stuff like that. Party is an example, modify is an example. So we're doing more design work to open things up so that the, the things you care about are there rather than being brand new. On top of that, we are looking at all the mechanics, like we have a list at, at an R&D of these mechanics, um, there's not enough yet to play with something like Commander. You can't make, it's hard to make like an energy commander deck or, I mean, to pick, pick your mechanic, but there's certain mechanics that you need a certain amount of volume. And so one of the things we've been trying to do between commander decks and looking at future premier things and looking at supplemental is try, instead of making brand new things that we've never, is going back to the well of trying to make more of the things that we've already invested in. And so we're doing a little bit more of that. Um, a thing I've been trying to do, but it's, it's been, I've been having a little bit of a challenge because each world's so different is I love overlapping mechanics. If two sets are back to back and the same mechanic can go in them, I, I want to do more of that. Um, the challenge is they have to be organic to the worlds they're in, and sometimes it lines up, but for example, um, like, I can't go, this is stuff you don't know, but there's a set of coming where I wanted to do this one mechanic back to back, and it turned out that for play design reasons, I couldn't. So I'm experimenting where we can do that. I, 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 I recognize what you're saying. I understand the tension of it. We do want to find answers for that. Um, Has every damn conversation been had, or is that just completely... Everything, every set has to have five mechanics. No well, mechanics. I mean, right now, due to numerous factors, Commander being part of it, digital play being so popular part of it, um, we are right now been ramping up a little bit of complexity rather than ramping down. Um, basically, it's a combination of Commander just being a more complex format that people are being introduced to, and digital doing much better support of handling more complexity, that we have found the audience able to handle a little bit more complexity than they have in the past, so, we're actually slightly ramping up in complexity, not ramping down in complexity. So I don't think right now we're going to go down in mechanics. In fact, the reverse is happening. We're going to make more things uh, deciduous. Like we made, um, we made in uh, Street of Japan, we made, um, what's the discovery card drop card? Um, cycling. We made cycling deciduous. There's more of that coming. Um, you will see in some sets this year and next year, there's things that are just going to be a deciduous thing that weren't before. Um, in fact, I, I'm not sure, I know it happens in Martha's War, I'm not sure if it happens in, it might happen in Dominator United. But anyway, there's more decision stuff coming. We're, we're just going to call it what it is, rather than give it, not, not call it what it is. So we're going to do more of that. So what I'm saying to you is no, I guess we're not doing that. Um, <laughs> You're having more! <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next. Uh, hello, I'm going to be asking a question for somebody who's going to make it today. Okay. Uh, so with, uh, their question involves this, so with stuff like, since Companion got changed to mm -hmm. have the three to put it into yeah. your hand, does this open or allow for more design space for maybe future Commander pre-cons to maybe explore with Companions or maybe in the future Companions being completely maybe reintroduced knowing what happened the first time around and might have different design space? The problem we ran with Companion originally is we really ran out of space. Like there's, ironically, um, Infinity did look at doing one or two like Companion cards because there's silly Companion stuff we can do that we didn't do before. Well, we didn't, but um, the, there's, I mean, I'm not saying we can't make more Companions, but it's, it's very limited. We have, we have to sort of solve some problems because we used up, more, like to make Companions, the, the, the number one rule that limited us is we wanted companions to be something your opponent could recognize if you were breaking a rule. And a lot of our companions, they couldn't. And so we said, okay, those are off limits. Like, your opponent has to know if you're breaking the rule. So that really, really limits what we can do. Um, I don't anticipate companions in the short run, but commander decks have been doing a lot more one-ups, if you'll notice. Uh, I do think there's a possibility of a one-up companion. I I'm skeptical of it bringing as a whole mechanic coming back in a, like a premier set, I'm skeptical of it. Okay, thank you. All right, so given that Legends is getting redistributed yes. into Dominaria United, yes. is there any way that the reserve list can get reprinted? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Okay, so first off, I mean, 
the nice thing about the, so first off, we we had a warehouse that we used for many, many years. We were, we decided we didn't want to use it anymore. And while they were cleaning it up, that's what we're not making it up. It's not like cold cold snap or something where we're joking around. We literally found them in one of our own distributor warehouses. Um, the nice thing about it is us putting them in packs doesn't change how many exist in the world. I mean, I guess they were hidden away, but but they got printed. They were printed. They existed. Um, we do hear, like, it's not like we don't hear the audience saying they want the reserve list to go away. The, here's one of the larger problems is the people that want it aren't being vocal about it because it's very hard for social media to be vocal about it. Because when they have the parts in warehouses hidden away somewhere? <laughs> they were literally there. We, we didn't make this up. They were literally the secondary there. market that has it hidden away that doesn't want to reprint something. They're not uh, the vocal ones. Sure. Uh, we do hear that people want the cards that are on the list. And I'm not, it's not that we don't know you guys want it. Um, the, the hard part for me is there's literally things that I'm forbidden from talking about. Uh, and so I, it's kind of like we can't do it for reasons I can't tell you, which is not very, uh, it's not a great answer to hear because, like, well, tell me what the reasons are. Um, but I like my job, so I can't do that. Um, so, I mean, the voice of the people wanting more reprints, especially things that are currently off limits, it is not as if r doesn't, and Wizards as a whole doesn't hear that. Um, are there creative workarounds that is something that, I mean, our, our ultimate goal is to give the audience what they want in a way that doesn't violate promises we made. And if we can find clever ways to do that, I, we're all, we're willing to entertain the clever ideas, but we're trying really hard to be true to what we've said. So, stickers is a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Hi, this should be a really quick question. Okay. I very much enjoyed the dice rolling additions in the Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. yes. And I was wondering if we'd be seeing more of those. In the there is dice rolling, yes. In, in fact, there are multiple draft archetypes in the ball dice rolling. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and with maybe one exception, all the dice on cards are turned on. I'm uh, I think we can all agree that the uh, playtest card, Morrow's Gone Nuts, has finally made it to the black border after seeing all this. <laughs> but um, this is a question from a couple of friends of mine that are on a Commander podcast. Okay. Uh, with all the designs and auxiliary products coming out, as well as digital card designs and universes beyond that are being released regularly now, is there ever going to be a committee similar to the Council of Colors to oversee all the things that one person or league might not be able to cover on their own? Oh, okay, so, I'm sorry. So other than color, what quality are you looking at? Just uh, auxiliary and special products like line sets and, and commander sets, I guess, in particular, they would want to know. I mean, R&D does holistically kind of look at what the products are as a whole. Um, like, one of the challenging things, so in a, another co commander, while well, there's Lots of awesome things for all the players. For us behind the scenes, there's a lot of weird new problems we have to solve. It used to be when we made sets and we made eight different sets, you could care about set two and three and not care about set four. But Commander uses every card we ever print. So it's very hard to make sets you don't care about when every, like every single set matters for Commander. And so it's a little bit of a challenge. But a lot, a lot of the point of some of the sets used to be, well, this is more for this audience, this is more for that audience, and Commander sort of brought things more together. Um, and we're, yeah, that's a tricky thing to solve. Um, one of the things that I, I think is very interesting is one of Richard Garfield's original vision for Magic was that the audience didn't know everything. And so one of the really interesting things of the current system is with few exceptions, the audience doesn't know anything. And that, in some ways, overloading the system of just, you can't absorb all the information, is a very interesting way to parallel not knowing things. And I think that, it, it's very fun, there's a lot of things that Richard wanted early on that we kind of we deviated away from. Okay, and then we sort of we push, push it back in, and so I think that is one of them, and that, I, I kind of enjoy that when you go play uh, your commander game or whatever now, your opponent literally can play something you might not know. And I, I think that's really cool and compelling. So anyway, um, that happened to be my last question. Uh, we, have to, we have to wrap up so the, the next room can get this room.
So I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, For Infinity and for Dominator United and Brothers War and all stuff coming. So thank you guys for coming and I hope to see you all on social media.